Our next speaker is, as you can read on your program, the past president of the Catholic Physicians Guild. He is from Richmond Hill, New York City. He is a member of the head of the uh, Committee on Conservative Literature, I believe. Decent literature. He has debated, debated uh, those figures, those personages on the American Civil Liberties, of whom you have heard. He has been on TV programs from coast to coast. He has appeared on many campuses. He has gone into this subject, which is of great concern to many people, the effect of pornography upon our students and upon our people. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Dr. William Riley. The second best introduction I've ever received in my life. The first occurred about three months ago when the chairman didn't show up. I introduced myself. <laughs> Humility is not one of my virtues, according to my wife. Seriously, I know time is wasting. I'm not saying time has been wasted. We got off to a late start. Mr. Benson follows me. We have approximately an hour and 15 minutes. I was scheduled for an hour which is just getting warmed up, actually. But uh, I promise you that I will be finished giving Mr. Benson a fair deal here at uh, 20 after 12. You know, after listening to the previous speakers that we had yesterday, and of course today, it's a good deal like the Mets following the Boston Red Sox. I'm a Brooklyn man, born, bred, and true, and we still love our Mets. But one must face reality at times. And I wonder when the people in Brooklyn are going to wake up to what's happening to them, certainly in the baseball field. I address my remarks, of course, to the clergy and all those manufacturers, bankers, little old ladies with tennis shoes that our left-wing press so glibly alludes to for the members of the Bird Society. Again, I do not belong to the John Bird Society, but I assure you my Sympathies are there completely. <laughs> to belong to the Bird Society in New York City, believe me, would prevent me from going on TV and radio. This is a known fact. The establishment presses a button and everybody jumps. Oh, I can give you many facts and issues on this, but frankly, even long before the John Bird Society was established, I did counterintelligence corps work in the army. We had classes on communism. Unfortunately, I was stopped. They told us we could only do it outside of the army bases. So they say my sympathies are completely with the John Bird Society. I was advised, by the way, not to come here. We might compromise the citizens for a decent literature. I do not believe that. I think the tide is turning. The spirit of the people is manifesting itself. It's like a grassroots that took place, that has taken place through that great state of Nebraska, Mr. Thomas belongs to, all the way out to the west, and of course right into the heart of Brooklyn. By the way, a few nasty remarks were mentioned about New York City yesterday. Not really, of course. I take umbrage with it in a facetious manner. In the first place, it's not easy to be a conservative in New York. I would say a moment of silent prayer for the conservatives in New York. But we are coming a long way. In fact, in my own neighborhood, I was asked to run for Congress this time. I used to be a delegate out in San Francisco. But the regular Rep Republican Party in New York City sabotaged that. Mr. Kenner, Republican chief, would not accept any conservative party support, and they would not give any. Of course, I was also afraid that possibly the opposition now at the Citizens for Decent Literature was starting to reach pay dirt in New York City. 
that it might be thrown at me that these four years we've been active, not myself, my group, people like Frank Capel, who's the head of the Staten Island group, Monsignor Cleary, the Operation Richmond group, wonderful people, every one of them. By the way, this Catholic Man of the Year award that I received was not meant for me necessarily. In a particular plaque signed by Bishop McIntaggart, a great man, by the way, who did a lot to write workmen's compensation laws in New York State. He said in there, we give homage, not only to Dr. Riley, but to the vast number of people who are working with him. Just like you people are leading the way. Oh, abuse, calumny, detraction, we know that. It's the price you pay for standing up and being counted. Well, you don't have to hang your heads in shame, and certainly you don't. Even the New York Times the other day had a relatively conciliatory article on the John Burt Society, which they said the people of America must learn to coexist now. <laughs> they said these people are respectable in their communities as such because of their middle class socioeconomic status, but they are still outcasts because of their political viewpoints. However, it was most unusual. The New York Times. I have to read it because we have to know what the other side thinks. It's like reading the Compass or PM or the Daily Worker, the Partisan Review, the New Mass or the National Guardian. You have to read it. Oh, a risk. I don't think, as these speakers have said, like Dr. Vaskovich, I think it was yesterday, his opinions aren't going to change, neither of yours or mine. I'm going to just entitle this little talk. After listening to Monsignor Cleary in that very beautiful summation of the encyclical, from the sublime to the slime. That's what it is. By the way, before I get on, I know I'm not supposed to mention her name. Her name is Anna. She has an Irish name at the end, I believe. Very fine person. She's the one that talked me into this. I couldn't feel more happy or more proud, but to her, of course, speaking for the people of New York City, we wish you well. We really do. The slobs that we have in New York City are like boils on the body politic. As Father Van Quole said yesterday, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have a few characters we are not proud of, including Senator Jacob Javits of New York. I'm not too happy with Senator Keating anymore. I don't know what happened to him, but it certainly did. New York City is a good city, and we're proud of it. I defy anybody in this whole community here, this organization, to point the finger of scorn at the people of New York City. It's like trying to be an atheist in the middle of a beautiful church organization. It's tough. Well, let me just tell you this, that all the work that you people are doing will go for naught if we don't stem this tide of pornography. The people who back this up have two motives. On one side, destroy the concept that we have of religion, of decency and morality. And the other side, destroy the concept that we have of respect for authority. Starting with the parents, then to your clergymen, the policemen on the beat, and up to and including the President of the United States. I am talking about a lack of respect that is not justified. We destroy these things. And we destroy the very roots on which this country is being nourished. Communists have said under Mr. Khrushchev, dictator Khrushchev, we will bury you and your grandchildren will live under communism. I have been advised by some of the most important people I can think of in New York City to forestall, do not talk too much about communism because we have enough to stand on to indict the people who may not be communists, who may not even be socialists. I think they're even worse than that. They are amoral imbeciles. 
No sense of religious concept. These people are parasites. The very antithesis of human dignity. They're worse than pigs. At least pigs do what they're supposed to do. They wallow in filth. But by God, we are not going to allow our children and even ourselves as average people to wallow in the filth that these people are making, not only for you, but primarily for that one element of our society that is unable to fight back because they have not the emotional maturity at the present time to know what's being thrown at them. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a $2 billion a year business. It's a dirty, despicable, diabolical one, too. I've debated these men. Ralph Ginsburg of Eris Magazine. I've debated the American Civil Liberties Union three times now. And believe me, in all due modesty, we demolish them because we have truth on our side. These are immutable truths. They still believe the old liberal fallacy that there are no such thing as immutable truths and therefore why should we be held responsible for things that were held to be truthful 10 years ago? And which makes them even less responsible than might happen 10 years from now. Oh, these people have a lot to answer for. But when the American people are fully aroused, and by the way, the same argument I am using now, by virtue of it, I was called a Nazi by Otto Preminger. This he didn't dare say it over the air. He said it after the program. But they were far away from Otto Preminger. All I said to him is when the American people are fully aroused, they may not care too much what happens to them as such, but they are going to fight back when their very, the fruit of their own bodies is sullied and destroyed and being debauched. Does it make sense for me as a physician or a clergyman or you people as fine parents to do the best you can for these children, the best of food, the best of clothing, the best of religious training? And let their spirit be destroyed. It's precisely that. It's a diabolical situation. Senator Vestas Keith Alvin has report, the late senator, when he was a chairman of the committee investigating the cause of juvenile delinquency, and I believe, by the way, we should allude to it as juvenile nobility for the great majority of American young people as young Americans for freedom and the average young American who knows what is going on. They are waking up. They are the very hope of the future. And they are waking up all over the land. Two billion dollars. This particular committee stated they were aghast when they considered the magnitude of this problem, and they were further aghast when they considered the sequelae on young people of America. Senator Kefauver said these things, this is geared to the average, the juvenile mind. And mind you, 70% of this material is bought by the young people between the ages of 13 and 19. That is where the Citizens for Decent Literature come in. We are a non-sectarian, non-partisan organization. We have the complete approval of the great majority of politicians and the clergy and responsible organizations, Lions, Kiwanis, Rotarian, and so forth throughout this entire United States. You'll pardon the expression, but Attorney General Robert Kennedy's own offer stated, if the American people wish to do something worthwhile about this problem, they could do nothing better than to join the Citizens for Decent Literature. Non-sectarian, no list, no boycotts. We don't tell anybody what they can read or what they can't read. We simply aim to educate the people as to what is on the stands and what is coming through the mails. And simply tell the people to crystallize their public opinion. And enforce the laws that are on the books. Ladies and gentlemen, obscenity is a crime and so declared in every state in the Union with the exception of New Mexico, and there it's a part of the education law. The big question, of course, is what is obscenity? We know we live in a pluralistic society. We have different opinions on this. But you in your heart and any decent person knows what's obscene and what's rough. But rightfully so when we know that it might involve somebody's basic freedoms of speech. Certain definite safeguards must be present. 
There were so many diverse opinions of what constituted obscenity and pornography that I'll use the term synonymously that we had to rely upon the United States Supreme Court 1957 in the Worth case decision which they finally gave us a workable definition of obscenity which is to it using contemporary community stands as a guide the dominant theme of a work is such that it appeals, appeals only to the average person's prurient interest. And then they added two years ago in the case of the homosexual magazines, which the United States Supreme Court declared not to be obscene. Man, the Grecian Guild, so forth. It must also be patiently offensive, which means not only shock the sensibilities, but also shock the senses. S-E-N, S-E-S. In that same decision, which the American Civil Liberties Union and the American Book Publishers Council and the American Library Association and the American Jewish Congress, who presents the, the, the four main groups that will prevent laws being promulgated in the United States, I say it without any fear of libel. I do not impugn their motives. I have my personal feelings, but I do not impugn their motives. They believe in absolutism, but I digress just for the moment. Judge William Brennan in the 63 decision stated, the first and 14th amendment to the Constitution does not protect obscenity because it is utterly without any redeeming social value. And now, of course, the American Civil Liberties Union, Namicus Curiae brief only recently in the Lover's case, are fighting for the concept that this material has re redeeming social value because there is a small segment in our people who are so literary stupid they have not got that intellectual acumen to know anything better and they must have this as an escape from reality. They maintain unless it can be proven to be an overt anti-social act can, re can result from reading this. That nothing should be banned. We say to them, is there no such thing as public morality? And we go to no other but that great liberal pundit, Walter Lippmann, in his essays on public philosophy, in which he upholds the concept of a public morality, which you and I know exists anyway. And he stated, when the chaff of baseness and deception finally is removed, the people in general, in their whole concrete conciseness, are going to demand a follow-through on a code of public morality. And it would do well for the Supreme Court to follow this, because the Supreme Court just two weeks ago declared that the lovers, a moving picture from Ohio, that was rather from France, that was declared to be obscene by the Supreme Court of the great state of Ohio, that this material, that this should not be censored. And they threw out the indictment, or rather the previous conviction. The American Book Publishers Council in a debate with him, rather with Peter Jennison, WABC TV just about six months ago. He said, just how far are you people going to go? We have no argument with the CDL. You work within the law. We only want the laws enforced. I said, Mr. Janison, unlike you, I trust the courts in America. We live in a nation of laws. In this broad spectrum of democracy, in quotation marks, we have on one side liberty and the other side license. Where do we draw the line? The line will not be drawn until you people assert yourselves. But Sidney Hook, philosophy professor of NYU, a noted liberal, he came out only two months ago in an article in the New York Times book review section entitled Pornography and Censorship, and he backs up the basic standards that you and I hold. He said there was a higher law that transcends anything that any artist would like to do. The law of morality. He said it'd be just as ridiculous to have any artist be able to put out anything that they think is fit 
as it would be for any surgeon or any doctor to try to do what the Nazis did, to take any individual because he has some quirk in his mind, the surgeon I'm referring to, take out his heart, let it move it all around, expose it to all different types of temperatures, then put it back into him and see what happens. If any doctor even remotely suggested a such a thing as that, obviously he would be waiting for the little man in the white suit. So where do we go from here? What are these facts and figures? I mentioned, first of all, to try to put through laws that deal just with children actually is a very dubious legal step. Just as Felix Frankfurt has stated, he said, one cannot burn down the house to roast the pig. I think I stole a quotation from Father Van Quill yesterday. But he stated that himself, Justice Frank Butter. Primarily, way down deep, you and I know that's precisely what we're fighting for. It's a known medical axiom that genitals mature much more rapidly than the mind. We also know that young people have not the ability for abstract thinking. They think in the terms of the concrete. So therefore, I mention these few people as Ralph Ginsburg, Dr. Albert Ellis, so-called. I have been threatened with a libel suit because I stated Dr. Albert Ellis has very little professional standing in New York City. I repeat it. Dr. Albert Ellis has very little professional standing in New York City. This man is a genius, but he's sick. Sick, sick, sick. I heard this man speak over Barry Farber's show personally a year ago. By the way, this is the man that is being quoted throughout the United States. When I was in Akron, Ohio a few months ago, I debated a professor of psychology there, and he quotes Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis, as far as I am concerned, is mentally sick. His works are to be condemned as being destructive of the basic Judeo-Christian concepts upon which this great country has been founded and which it will survive. Albert Ellis stated over the Barry Farber show, he openly advocates premarital sexual experiences by anyone. Over the air, he stated this. And when Sylvia Schumann, the editor of the Anjuno magazine, it's a very fine magazine for young people, she said, Dr. Ellis, and it galls me to have this man call a doctor. Doctor, if you had a 14-year-old little girl, what would you do? She said, I would fit her with a diaphragm and tell her to do what she pleased. There was an immediate gasp from the audience. Barry Farber, I must admit, he's a good man, by the way. I have a few differences with him, but in general, he's a good man. He said, this man will never come on my program again. He apologized to the audience. I comment on Albert Ellis because he is used, by the way, as one of the authorities that the fact that Fanny Hill is a great work of literary art. I was the, I hate to be saying I, it sounds like braggadocio, but it just so happens, you wonder sometimes how you get in the middle of all this, as you people do. Well, here we are, for better or for worse. I recall 19 years ago, I signed a little contract when I went to the city hall. The law of honor and obey, no, my wife was to obey me. I know all hell broke loose later. They say it isn't the $2, it's $3 now for the marriage license, even less than the cost for dog license, I understand. The upkeep is tremendous. Oh, it's terrible. But this same man, you know, I do say one thing. I find my voice very fascinating. And consequently, I can go on and on, but I know Mr. Benson's going to get mad at me. And I'm a very gentle type of soul. I don't like to fight too much. Unless it's necessary, you know. And I, you know, I 
Remember one time I talked on and on and on. There was one character left, nothing personal. Way over at the very end, everybody else had walked out, but I'm not easily discouraged. <laughs> so I said, I appreciate the fact you've stayed to the very end. So what do you mean, stay? I'm the next talker. <laughs> And there was one time I was speaking to a local Catholic high school. I know the kids start to get a little bit restless. You know you've lost them. I had this gavel with me, and I'm banging away like mad to get their attention. And the head of the gavel came off and hit the mother superior right in the head, and out she went. <laughs> you don't have to be a doctor to have your main feelings, obviously. I ran down, and I said, Sister, I, I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. I apologize. I just had that vacuous look that was hit by a Mack truck, you know. I says, if anything I could do for you. She says, yeah, hit me again, you're still talking. <laughs> but I will tell you one little further thing. Now I'll get right down to the serious part. I see my time as a wasting. Over there in Pennsylvania Station in New York, so they had a mechanical robot. It was a, me it was a wonderful thing. And pass. No, it always has to be Pat. If I happen to be Italian, I'd give an Italian dialect or something, but it's always safe to stick to your own nationality, my racial background, which, by the way, I am more New England than you believe. We are direct descendants of James Whitcomb Riley, in case you're interested. <laughs> Maybe you're not. The, uh, <laughs> on my father's side, of course. Anyway, there was that situation over there, and Pat is looking at it, he figures he can't understand what's going on. But it seems people going over there, slapping a quarter in a machine, the card was coming out. They were looking at it and saying, that's right. Oh, Pat says, I'll go over. So he takes a look, he finds out for 25 cents a card will come out. It'll tell you your age, your nationality, you're waiting exactly where you're going. Pat says, oh, I don't believe it. He said, but I'm going to try it anyway. So he slaps in the quarter, and a card comes out and says, you're an Irish, and you're 60 years of age, you weigh 160 pounds, and you're going to Perth Amboy in a five o'clock train. Pat says, I don't believe it. He said, by God, it's right, though, he says. So way over in the corner, he sees an Indian with all the head, the feathers, and so forth. So he takes, he says, oh, he hasn't been there. So he takes himself over, and he says, be ye an Indian? He said, yes. He said, what type would you be? He says, Cherokee. He said, how old would you be? Seventy. How many pounds do you weigh? Say 170. Where are you going? He says, Philadelphia on a six o'clock train. Have you been to the machine? He says, no. Come on over, so I'll put the quarter in myself. So he goes over, he slaps in the quarter, and a card comes out, and it says, you're an Indian, Cherokee, 70 years of age, weigh 170 pounds, and you're going to Philadelphia on a six o'clock train. I don't believe it, he says. Well, I'll tell you what we do. Come on down, says he says, I'll put on your clothes, you put on mine. So Pat comes up with all the Indian clothes on, he walks over to the machine, he slaps it in a quarter, and a card comes out, and it says, you're an Irishman, 60 years of age, weigh 160 pounds. If you hadn't wasted so damn much time, you would have made the five o'clock train to Perth Amboy. <laughs> That's music to my ears. <laughs> if you all have a certain element of the ham in this, I guess. Well, now, I mention two people, not because I'm trying to honor them, but because they are the symbols of the present time of an opposition to what you stand for, not only in a moral field, but also in a political field. Ralph Ginsburg, number one. The present time, the American Civil Liberties Union is defending this man before the United States Supreme Court because not for Ralph Ginsburg as such, but for the fact he should be allowed to print anything he wants. Now, what did he put out? Eris Magazine, I'm not too terribly concerned about that. It's bad enough. Here's the one picture. It's obvious an act of sexual intercourse. This is meant for the intellectually elite, those who are freedom free and so forth. He was indicted on just one charge on Eris number four. But he was indicted on 19 charges in the housewife's handbook for selective promiscuity. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. What does it deal with? I don't mean to insult any of the fine ladies here, but it deals with the most in, the most innermost thoughts of the average housewife before, during, and after sexual relations, not only with her husbands, but also with her lovers. He deliberately, deliberately sent this out, the heirs of Eris and this, to almost every religious body in the United States. 
He sent them out, and this is fact, from Middlesex, Massachusetts, Intercourse, Pennsylvania, and Blue Balls, Pennsylvania. This is dirty language, I know it, but this is the kind of people that we're fighting. When I debated this man over WABC TV, he said, you people are psychopaths. You people haven't got the intellectual acuity to know what we're referring to. He said, I don't mean you, Dr. Riley. Oh, yes, you do, my friend. He said, you name me one good man who defends the citizens for a decent literature. Boy, he left with his chin and out one. His Eminence, Francis Cardinal Spellman, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Senator S. Key Father, Senator Dodd, J. Edgar Hoover, getting one right down the line. Then, of course, I even mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt, in my day, did state that she was opposed to this. And you know what Ginsburg said? Do not sully her fair name. <laughs> this man has a colossal goal. I was on CBS TV in New York two weeks ago. It was a tape show. Just to show a liberal establishment will not give you a break at all. They promised me right up and down. I spent two hours with them pointing out the things we were talking about, things that Cleveland Armory stated would make Henry Miller's topic of cancer look like a Boy Scout manual. We don't ordinarily mention books, but this is what Cleveland Armory, a noted intellectual, is a woven editor of the Saturday Review of Literature. Listen to this, I prowl by night, his boss's wife, girl on a couch, Passion Island, sex pack, the zipper cloth, and so forth. I said, okay, Mr. Waller. So I've been advised not to go on this. Because it was a loaded show. They take me for 40 minutes in my office. Well, he right down the line, District Attorney Frank O'Connor. For some reason, mother was cut out. Great man. Even though he's a Democrat. A great man. He is. I can't deny it. I said to him one day, how do you go along with this stuff, Mr. O'Connor? He said, well, maybe if I didn't, things would be a lot worse in New York. Something to that. Anyway, they cut out Mr. O'Connor. They presented Lieutenant Sullivan, New York State, New York City Police Department, a very fine man, but had to take a neutral stand, of course. How does the police department work? They had Sidney Hook on... The great things he had said, and the only minute they gave him was to state that he thought some kind of an artist's group should help the mayor. That's all he put on. And before I came on, they didn't distort my words. They talked about Anthony Comstock and pressure groups and how great works in the, in the past that were libeled as, as obscene now were great works of literature. Of course, we point out that no decent work of literature ever, ever, in the final analysis when it came to the United States Supreme Court have been declared obscene in lower courts was so declared to be obscene. However, before we went on, we was pointed out, we decided in our own group, two things could happen. They'll play it fair, which I didn't expect, or they'll try to clobber you, which we expected, which they did. But we got on the air. Same thing happened at NBC. Another show. I wasn't on that one. I was on a Mike Wallace show two years ago. Back before I became a little bit more prudent. I went out it so hot and heavy with Stanley Fleischman, and the left-wing lawyer, social, a lot of communist friends in California. And it got so hot and heavy they didn't put the show on. He said, you people don't work for legality, pressure groups. That's Mr. Fleischman. What might be legal may not be moral. I said, I wouldn't expect you to know Jesus Christ. But if you did, you would know that he was tried in a court of law. And there was no justice dispensed that day. And with that, he became apoplectic. <laughs> These people are parasites. Whether they're working hand in hand with the communist conspiracy is not for me to say. I think you and I know it's true. 
I know I'm getting pretty short here, not physically, my voice is. <laughs> Men we maintain before destroy decency, destroy respect for authority, carry the present party line. This is an exact quotation of Ralph Ginsburg from the village square, which he is, from the Greenwich Village Voice, which is an offbeat type of magazine quotation marks. We call this stuff cesspool publications, sub-literature. No more right to be called literature. Now I'm William Jennings Bryan, I suppose. Here's a question and answer. My glasses, I'm getting old. All this last year. Eris never seemed remotely obscene to me. This is the question being put to Mr. Ginsburg. It's only January of 64. Why do you think it was singled out for attack by the post office when there was so much less appetizing sex material around? Pressure from the Catholic Church to do so. I have documents in my possession proving this. The parent of the hierarchy feels Eris, in contradistinction to other publications dealing with sex, presents a very real threat to Roman Catholicism because Eris stands for the diminution and elimination of guilt feelings over sex. The Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, promotes guilt feelings over sex. As a matter of fact, it would collapse without them. Further, and this hits all religions, of course, with the word of understanding of Freudian psychology, which is inevitable, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, and that of all religions, really will diminish. We are moving slowly but inexorably toward a world in which the preservation and enjoyment of life will become a religion, and the deity will be man himself. This is the philosophy of Eris, the reason why the Roman Catholic Church finds it repugnant. But as you people well know, you start attacking anybody in religion, the rest are going to go. This is the next question. And what's the party line? What do you think are the subjects at least written about by American newspapers and magazines that are most in need of being written about and or exposed? This is, by the way, in fact, magazine. The crassness of big business. The humanity of our enemies. Russians are people just like you and me. We wouldn't argue that point. But we certainly argue about the communist. The threat to America posed by a, our enormous military complex, our spook establishment, the CIC, HUA, CFBI, and of course the anti-democratic maneuvers of the Catholic Church. This is the first issue of fact. By the way, we have, we've, uh, public, we have uh, subscribed to it. Whether well, they did it facetiously or not, this goes to my office, much to my regret. I hate to spend seven and a half bucks for it. Citizens for recent literature. This is the articles, Catholic plunder of the U.S. Treasury. I'd like to get some of it. Beyond a test ban treaty by Bertrand Russell. The man who thinks gold water was a communist by Ralph Ginsburg. America's first Negro president, Harding, he mentions. And the sexual symbolism of Christmas. Can you imagine? The reason why Santa Claus goes down the chimney, it's obvious, isn't it? I won't go into any further details on that. But this is Fact Magazine. Some thoughts on the science of onanism. Phil, this is Ralph Ginsburg. My wife always says, don't honor that man. I'm not honoring anybody. Simply saying to you that this is the type of individual, the type of books that he puts out. Cleveland Amory, Ines Robb, Harry Van Horn, Jimmy Breslin, Bosley Porther, John Crosby, the whole list of them. These are good people. These are people you might call intellectual left. But they are the ones who are saying today that we have to do something about this. Even the most atheistic and most agnostic individual knows there's something deep in here. Like the atheist that prays once in a while because he feels there might be something to it. Like that individual with Father Van Quo the other day. I'm an atheist, but the good law is with me today. This is the type of thinking that we have. These are people who are backing us up. Cardinal Spellman of New York City came out just the other day for a citizen's commission composed of all religious leaders, labor leaders, and so forth and so on to investigate this problem. Two minutes and I'll finish up. The Reader's Digest this month in May gave us a five-page article in the CDL. The facts and figures, just by the way, I'll make this fast. 
In America in 1962, we had 1,750,000 cases of juvenile delinquency. And no longer were these crimes committed against property. These were crimes against persons. Murder, mayhem, zip guns, every type of guns. And no longer was this thing simply an increase in proportion to the population. The American Academy of Pediatrics pointed out in a special brochure that with the juvenile population, the age group of 10 to 20 has increased only one-eighth. Crimes in the same thing have increased fully 20 times that. We had 5,000 young girls in New York City in 1962 expelled from the schools for illegitimacy between the age of 13 and 16. We had in the United States last year 310,000 illegitimacies and the age group getting lower and lower. It's estimated 40% of all the aid to dependent children in New York City specifically are unwed mothers, illegitimate children. The tremendous increase in homosexuality, both male and female. We have a tremendous increase in venereal disease throughout the United States. Five cities in the United States record a 1,500% increase in VD. Newark, New Orleans, Seattle, Long Beach, and Oakland, California. New York City reported a 484%, and the increase is now down on a 10-year level. When I spoke in Cleveland a few months ago, we had four young kids under three years of age with gonorrhea. I don't make up these figures. These are crimes that cry to heaven of vengeance. You could cry. Who's it aimed at? Yes, I could cry. But the people are being aroused. The increase in high school dropouts. What kid is going to keep his mind on books when he's constantly being perused with this? And remember, we are not so stupid as to say it's only books or the dirty things. And I am not referring to legitimate works of art. I'm referring to that other filth that I was just talking to, or talking about. Aim to the kids that can't fight back. Such a thing as an arousal curve with these kids. Just think about the ordinary homosexuality of children. The boy can't stand a little girl because she smells so sweetly. She has perfume behind her ears. A little girl can't stand the boy because he's sort of a slob. You know the type. He's dirt and all that. He's a garter snake in his pocket and so forth. This is ordinary, normal homosexuality. Then they reach the age of heterosexuality, which they are starting to learn that sex is a beautiful thing. At least they should learn it. The most intense of human emotions. It's a God-given thing for a particular reason. Procreation of children. And of course, quiet and of concupiscence or passion. We know these things. No greater authority than Eric Savaride himself. I don't agree with him politically, but he did state this. He said, for a long time, we thought that predilection with these bizarre, far-out themes was no more and no less than out to make a fast dollar. This was quoted in the New York Post, April 17, 1962, of all papers. Yep, town daily work, do we call it? It's true. He said a small coterie of homosexuals have banded themselves together to form themselves into an authority and to force their sick abnormality upon otherwise healthy people. When these kids get this stuff thrown at them day in and day out, it acts as a catalyst to stimulate them into outright acts of vandalism. We know we're in the middle of a third world war, whether we like it or not. Thousands upon thousands of working mothers. I'm not even talking about those people who all have to work in order to give them the basic, the basic barest necessities. But I'm talking about those who want a Cadillac instead of the family Ford. I'm not going into the products of divorce, but we know it takes two to tango. The father must give the point of authority, and the mother gives the gentility. What is a kid going to do? I can send over seven million stepchildren throughout the United States because of it. I'm not talking about the morality of it. These are situations that psychiatrists have spoke about time and time again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to take up any more time for Mr. Benson. Let me just finish up by stating this. Think of this problem. The CDL is willing and ready at any time to help you. Cincinnati, Ohio, 3701 Carew Tower. I did not bring out literature for the simple reason, as I told you before, I was advised in the first place not to come, not by CDL people, but it might destroy the CDL. I believe in fair play, and I know this is not going to happen. That is why we have not in literature here with us.
What are you supposed to tell a 15-year-old boy who has a rash of syphilis? In my office two months ago, the first time I've seen him since my days in the Army. What do I tell a 14-year-old little girl with gonorrhea? And what do I tell little kid in my practice, a 12-year-old little mother? The father's 14. I was at that birth because she's a little skinny little thing. My own daughter is 15, I have a kid of nine. My son is up here. All during that pregnancy, doing her labor. The obstetrician cried and so did I as a pediatrician. All a little kid could say, Mom, Daddy, where are you? Where are you? Where are these people that are out playing golf and bowling and doing ceramics? They're not doing what you people are doing. At least we won't be surprised if the commies were to take over. But by God, I'd like to see their face. But I know it's not going to happen, but I'd like to see it. One final little thing. Get that rapport with your child. Watch these males. Read the article in the Reader's Digest. I won't take up any more time. They are going to do an article in New York State soon. One final little thing. Little boy of mine, patient of mine, he had a beautiful globe at the Unisphere at the World's Fair. Everything was on it. All the mountains, all the rivers, plateaus, steps, etc., etc. It lit up when he pressed buttons. This was his prized possession. His prized possession. His father came in this one night. He was doing a, some kind of a crossword puzzle. He wanted to find out what the capital of Turkey was or something. And he walked upstairs. Inadvertently, he knocked over this globe and destroyed it. Little boy said to his father, Daddy, what are you doing with my world? 